are in the book of Mark, chapter 9. We're con continuing to look at this gospel. As we look at this gospel this morning, we are going to be getting a power lesson. In John chapter 14, Jesus talks to his disciples about going away. And they didn't like that. They liked Jesus being right there with them physically. They liked seeing him. They liked being close to him. And the thought of him going away was not something they liked to entertain. But with that, Jesus said, as I go away, I will send you a helper. That as I go away, you're not going to be left alone. You're not going to be abandoned. You're not going to be orphaned. But you're going to be given the Holy Spirit. And he'll live in you and empower you to do the things that you are called to do and to live the life out that you are called to live. And so the disciples are learning a lesson about the power of God when Jesus goes away. And we see throughout the New Testament this emphasis on the need for this power. And we see the emphasis about how to have this power and how to appropriate this power. But we also see that oftentimes in the New Testament, many Christians, many believers did not engage and appropriate the power that was given to them. We see this, for example, in Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, where Paul says to the Galatians, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And so this is something pertinent and important, I would say critical, vital for us to understand this morning. Are we living our Christian life out in the power of God? It's very easy just to be in a place where we have knowledge and information about God and that's what we go by and yet we're not empowered to do the things that God has called us to do. So why do we need this power? Is being a Christian just something we can do on our own and just uh, some, some information that we get and we read our Bible and we find out information and facts and we just sort of acknowledge those in our mind? It, it, is it just that? It has to be something different. We need God's power because we cannot live the Christian life out without it. And a powerless Christian is a failing Christian. We need, need God's power to run the race. We need God's power to bring forth spiritual fruit. We need God's power to go through suffering with joy. We need God's power to walk in the light, to be transformed, to not backslide, to break the chains of sin. We need God's power to minister the love of Christ and to know the love of Christ. We need God's power to praise him and worship him appropriate, appropriately. We need God's power to be pleasing to him. We need God's power to not enter into temptation and on and on and on. And so Jesus, in our text before us, is teaching his disciples about this power that they will need. It's not an option. And so let's look at the text starting in verse 14 and we're going to go through to verse 29. So it says, When he, Jesus, came to the disciples, where was he coming from? He was coming from the place of power. He was coming from a display of power on the Mount of Transfiguration. We talked about that last week. Jesus 
was revealing to his three disciples, not twelve, three, Peter, James, and John, a little bit of his power. It was for a brief moment, and it wasn't full, his full power, but it was enough for his disciples to not want to leave. It was enough for his disciples to want to stay there and to live their rest of their life out in that power, in that glory that Jesus was putting on display as he let a little bit of who he was shine forth even more and he was transfigured. And so now, like in many mountaintop experiences and many spiritual high experiences, we must come back to reality because we're not in heaven yet. Our Christian life is lived out in these lands. We might want to call them in the valley. It's not lived on the mountaintop. It's lived in the valley. It's lived in a place of warfare. And that's why Peter didn't want to come down. It was nice there. But they came down. And that's why it says when they came to the disciples, they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and the nine disciples who did not go, they were left down. And as they were left down, we find that they were in a situation. Here's the situation. He, Jesus, he saw a great multitude around them, around the nine disciples. Basically, they were surrounded and they were surrounded, and it says the scribes, those religious authorities in Judaism and the law, were disputing with the disciples. So the, the nine disciples were in a situation where Jesus wasn't there physically with them, and they were surrounded sort of by a, a mob of people. And this, this was led by these religious authorities. And these religious authorities were creating this, this scene where, where the nine disciples were not doing very well. They weren't used to the, the nine. They weren't used to, one, not having Jesus right there with them to come in and, and help them, which we have seen throughout the Gospels, haven't we? We've seen Jesus is the one who leads the way, and the Pharisees come, the scribes come. Uh, they come to Jesus, and, and Jesus puts them in their place. But this is different. Jesus wasn't there. And then they didn't have their particular leaders, Peter, James, and John. And so, so they're in this situation where everybody was just sort of piling on them and we actually have the word disputing with them challenging them and in verse 15 it, it says immediately when they saw him when they saw Jesus this mob of people all the people were greatly amazed so it was as, as if they weren't expecting Jesus and as they were attacking successfully the disciples, the nine disciples, then Jesus showed up and they were amazed. They, they were surprised. There he is. And they ran to him, it says, and they greeted him. And in verse 16, Jesus then steps in. And this is the protective nature of Jesus as he's seen his disciples pummeled, if you will, with disputes. And as we're going to see later, probably they're mocking them. They're probably calling them frauds, fake. They don't understand the things of God and the scribes are leading this and the people are there witnessing this whole scene. And Jesus steps in and he asks the scribes, the attackers 
of the disciples. And he said, what are you discussing with them? And, and really what he's saying is, what are you arguing with my disciples about? Notice how he addresses those who are in charge, sort of like the bullies. Jesus goes right after the bullies. He goes after those bullies and said, what are you arguing with my disciples about? In verse 17, then one of the crowd answered, notice it wasn't the scribes, Jesus, his appearance shut them down. They've already experienced disputing with Jesus, arguing with Jesus, and it hasn't gone well for them. And so Jesus steps in and he, he says, what are you arguing with my disciples about? And they are silent, but someone from the crowd, it says, answered Jesus. And Matthew tells us that this one that is answering from the crowd fell on his knees before Jesus and shouted and said, teacher, I brought you my son, and Luke tells us it was his only son. And my son has a, a mute spirit. My son cannot speak. And notice this in verse 19. I'm sorry, verse 18, it says, And wherever it seizes him. So what we're finding out is that there is a power that is overtaking this young man or child. There's a power and notice that it's being pointed out that this is not a biological condition. This is not a pathological condition or a physiological condition. Condition. This is not a dysfunction in a part of his body. You notice that? It's, it's spiritual. And this is what the Father knows and points out. That's critical to understand. Because the, the Father is recognizing that this is a spiritual problem, not a physical problem. And that's why he, he points to... His son, and he, he says that there's a power that is actually overtaking or overpowering his son. So much so that in verse 18 it says that this power seizes him. And that word seizes him actually means to take eagerly and apprehend. So it's, it's almost as if there's a power, it's a spiritual power, that this man is recognizing that takes his son and, and grabs his son. It's like being overpowered by somebody grabs his son, seizes his son, apprehends his son so that his son is now in the control of something that he is not able to fight against. And what does it do? It throws him down. So there's, there's a power that grabs and overpowers this individual, and it throws him down, and, and that word throw him down means it, it breaks him, it wrecks him, it cracks him, it shatters him to minute fragments. So there's violence. This violent, dark entity grabs him, takes control, and then physically tries to destroy him. So it throws him down, on the ground to, to the extent where it's like body slams him. This is not him being tripped or laid down. This is like WWE top rope throwing down, but it's not fake. It's actually real. 
As this is going on, he foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth, which means he bites down so hard on his teeth that you can sort of hear that, that sound of, of gnashing. And then he becomes rigid. So this is, this is what this man, you can see, this is his only son. The nine disciples are, are down the mountain, and it's known that wherever these disciples would be, that Jesus would, would be with them. And Jesus wasn't with them, but this man was desperate. You don't get these opportunities very often for Jesus to come and, and pass by. And, but Jesus wasn't there, but the disciples were brought this individual. As the disciples were brought this individual, you can just imagine what this man, the father, was going through, his only son, and to watch a child suffer like this and to not be able to have any ability to do anything to help. He was helpless. He was desperate. But he knew to bring him to Jesus. But Jesus wasn't there. So it says, he spoke to the disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. In other words, they didn't have enough power, spiritual power, to overcome this dark spiritual power. So first off... What we find and what we're learning, we're getting a power lesson. We're learning how to overcome with the power that God has given us. But what we have to first understand is that there is a power of darkness. This is something uh, a lot of times we don't like to think about. We don't like to talk about. Sometimes our idea of Christianity is more just this wispy, airy, feely, cloudy, everything is beautiful and perfect and nice and tidy and neat. But you can't read the Bible and get that impression. When you read the Bible, you read things like this that tell you that it's, it's more like war. It's more like warfare. It's more like battle. It's more like light and darkness. It's it's, it's more like that than it is this sort of dreamy, cloudy, wispy, emotional type of feely faith. And the reason for that is because there's a real devil who has real fallen angels serving him, who is looking to destroy, who is looking to bring down and harm. And so we get descriptions about this power of darkness more like this. In John 10.10, 10, it says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, that doesn't sound real wispy and sweet and doily and that sort of thing. This sounds pretty serious. If there is actually a power that is on the move to steal, kill, and destroy. In 2 Corinthians 11.14, it says, Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, he blinds the eyes of people so they can't see the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 10.4, it says he puts strongholds in people's lives. In John 8.44, he's a liar. In 1 Peter 5.8, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for who he might devour. In 1 Timothy 4.1, he's deceitful and he works through false prophets. In 1 John 5.19, it 
the world is under his influence. So when we read things like that and understand things like that, we have to know and understand that this is something to take very seriously. And if you've been a Christian for a little while, you realize that and know that. And you've seen how Satan works in the lives of people that don't take these things seriously. You see that there is a power that he has and that he uses and exercises in our world, the things that we see going on, do we realize that there's a force behind those things that we may look at the people or the philosophies or the enticements or whatever it may be, but do we realize behind those things is a force of darkness that we're just seeing the things on the surface. But behind those things is a real power and a real force. And so we need to understand and take those things seriously if we're going to live our life out correctly as believers because as we're seeing in our example, the disciples were not being successful. And it wasn't long ago that we've seen in Mark chapter 6 where the disciples were sent out two by two and were given power over unclean spirits, and they were successful. So what, what's going on now? Why are they not successful? Why are they not exerting and exercising that power that Jesus gave to them in Mark chapter 6? Well, let's let this develop a little bit. So we first understand and take seriously the power of darkness. That, that changes a lot. That'll change a lot. If, if you see things like they really are and how the Bible tells us, as you see those things in the world and you see those things in the Bible, then something will change. And it, what will change is you won't take lightly your dependence on God anymore. You won't take lightly your spiritual disciplines. It won't be a, an option anymore. It'll be something that's absolutely vital to your Christian life, to, to practice your spiritual disciplines, to live your life in and under the power of God. But see, when you don't take these things seriously, and maybe a reason for that is you can have natural explanations for things going on. For example, in our day and age, what, day and age, what would we do with the person like this? We'd give them medication. We'd say they're epileptic. And there are people who are actually have a biological, physical problem that can be helped like this. But are we looking at everything and just an, with a natural explanation? Well, look what happens. So in verse 19, here's how Jesus responds. He, he answers the man who brought the child and his answer is, O oh, faithless generation. And when you have that word, O, oh, in front of that, that's a way to describe that this was painful for Jesus, what he was seeing, what was happening. He says, oh, faithless generation. That was painful for him. Imagine Jesus, the time that he has spent with his Disciples, the time that he has spent showing his power, displaying what he can do, and still just a continual insistence of only looking at things in the natural and not recognizing and realizing things in the spiritual. This was the problem. And that's why he's, he, he directs this, I believe, he directs this, this statement to his disciples, the nine. And I believe that because of what he says later is the answer for why they couldn't cast this demon out. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I believe he's directing this statement at the nine disciples because they, they kept getting hung up. And we've seen this throughout the Gospels. They kept getting hung up 
by just looking at things in the natural and not the spiritual. And that's where most of their theological problems occurred and why they couldn't understand the things that Jesus was saying in particular. And the most obvious is that they can only see Jesus as the Messiah who would reign in this world politically in their time, overthrowing the Roman government. They didn't see a, a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom that he needed to die and raise again first so people can have their sins forgiven and enter. All they can think about was the here and now and the temporary and what they can see in front of them. And this was the problem with the nine disciples. And that's why Jesus says, oh, faithless generation. But as he directs this statement to his disciples, I believe the disciples are also representatives of then the bigger picture, the scribes who are not exercising any faith, and then the multitudes of people who are not exercising faith. And so as Jesus points this out and diagnoses and points out, this is the problem. You're faithless. And you're, you're seeing life without faith. And the reason they were doing that is because they can only go by what they saw. Now here's the problem. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. So for a believer, faith is sort of like the eyesight in the spiritual realm. It's like our eyes. It's by faith that we see and understand things. So if, if, we, if we look at the world's problems, say, for example, if we look at our problems and we only see the exterior part, and we never address the spiritual part, then we too are faithless. And then we go about finding human solutions to our problems instead of understanding it's a spiritual problem. And to understand things like that spiritually. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, which I, I find this interesting because Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration Peter came down the mountain and was here in this scene. And Peter, Peter probably gave these facts to Mark to write. So here's what Peter says. 1 Peter 1.8 Jesus, whom having not seen, you love. Is that true of you? Though now you do not see him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So by faith, the reality of Jesus is more a reality to you and I than to those who just saw him. Those who saw him, not all of them believed. Even Thomas, his disciple, had a hard time believing until he put his hands in Jesus' hands and in his side. And then he believed. But the reality of Jesus, isn't it to you more real than anything else that there is? Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Have you ever seen Jesus? We've seen him work. We have him in our heart. But the five senses that we have are not more reliable than faith. And sometimes we think our five senses are more, uh, more reliable. And I see some of you wearing glasses. Some of you may have, be having hearing aids. Some of you, we know our five senses aren't that reliable. But yet we put so much stock in those things. But if you're a believer, your faith makes Jesus more real than anything else. And because of that, you worship him. Because of that, you're here. Because of that, you open your Bible because you know it's true. You know it's real. 
He's in your heart. And faith is a much better way to see God than our sight. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. This is what Peter learned. So Peter saw him in person. But then he's telling those who became believers after Jesus ascended to heaven and he's telling them, you're in such a better place to have faith and believe, even though you haven't seen, your faith tells you this is real and you know without a doubt that Jesus is alive and well and one day you'll see him face to face. It's your faith that tells you that. So as believers, we see by faith. We walk by faith. This is how we live our life. That's what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He says, we've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by what? By faith. Hebrews chapter 11, read that for homework tonight. By faith, they did this. By faith, they did this. By faith, they did it. It's by faith we do these things. But Jesus is saying, it's because of your lack of faith, you couldn't do this. And he, then he says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? You, in, in other words, Jesus knows he's going to be gone soon. He went away briefly on the Mount of Transfiguration and he came back pretty quick. But in John chapter 14, he goes on and talks about, I'm, an, I'm going to go away. And it's not going to be like a quick thing. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And there will be a time I'll come back and I'll get you and you'll come to this place and you'll be with me and, and at that time it'll be forever but right but right now there's going to be a, a time of physical separation from me and that's why Jesus is saying how long are you not going to get this how long shall I bear with you and what Jesus is teaching them and teaching us is the importance of faith and how faith is not optional, but is required in order for us to experience the power of God over darkness that is looking to take us in a different direction. So Jesus says, so bring him to me. Verse 20, it says, they brought him to Jesus. And when he saw him. The boy, immediately the spirit convulsed him. So this demon inside of this young boy, as this young boy was brought to Jesus, just the very presence of Jesus caused this demon to freak out, if you will. This demon didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus, light has no fellowship with darkness. Demons are not in a cosmic competition with God. They are no competition with God. The power of God is supreme and ultimate. And it's not like God has to arm wrestle Satan and his demons, and it's this big struggle, and, and maybe at the end, God will kind of get the edge and get them. It's not like that. The power of God is supreme and ultimate, and that's why, and this demon knows this, this demon just gets in the presence of Jesus, and he freaks out. What is this demon doing? This demon is exercising a last ditch effort to kill this boy because he knows his time is over. We see this throughout the Bible, ultimately through the book of Revelation, right before Jesus comes back, we see this height of spiritual and demonic power being exercised in the tribulation. When Satan knows 
Someone is slipping out of his hands. Many of you are sharing Jesus with people. And many of you experience heartbreak, pain, seeing they may come a little bit to this understanding and then they go back even more and your heart breaks and just know that they're, they're in a spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle is being fought and you need to continue to pray through this spiritual battle. And as, as you do, Satan is doing all he can to hold on. And what he's trying to do is kill this kid. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to kill this kid. And so he sees Jesus and he throws him down or he convulses him. And he's saying, this is my last shot. And he fell on the ground, this boy, and he foamed at the mouth. And this demon was exercising all of his power to put an end to this boy. And so he, Jesus, as he's seen this occur, notice what he does. He asks the father, how long has this been happening to him? And his father said, from childhood. This father has been experiencing this spiritual power over his son, his only son, throughout this child's life. And imagine what this father is going through. Seeing a power over his son's life, that power is trying to kill him. And this father can do nothing. He just watches his son being slammed to the ground probably getting concussions, probably biting his tongue, breaking his teeth as he gnashes his teeth. And the father just watches this. And the father goes on as Jesus asks him how long, and what was Jesus asking him that for? He was asking him that because Jesus wants this man to know that he understands him. This was an act of compassion. This was an act of Jesus wanting to know, how do you feel? Jesus knew how long it was going on, but he wanted the man to say and express to Jesus, this has been going on his whole life. This has been my life. Any parent knows you can't detach yourself from your child and just undetached, let them go through things like this, that you feel these things. You hurt, maybe even more than the individual that's going through it, the pain of a parent. That's what he's feeling. And Jesus wants to connect with him, wants to share with him, wants to talk with him about it. And he, he's seeing right in front of him this going on. He says, how long has it been going on? He says, it's been from, from childhood. And now Jesus is connecting with this man. Now Jesus is sharing with this man in his pain. That's what compassion is. And the man goes on in verse 22 and he says, He often has thrown him both into the fire and both into the water to what? Destroy him. This is what parents often see when Satan gets a hold of of a child, of their child, some go through alcoholism, drugs, and they watch, they get calls, they hear about the plights of their child, they know they're in spiritual warfare, and they live this life of just waiting for that one final call where they're going to hear the worst news of their life. They're always wondering where they are, what they're doing, what's going on, because there's a destructive nature of the power of darkness that is looking to destroy that individual. It's not like some just neutral thing. If you're not going in the direction of Christ, following Him as your Lord and Savior, you're in darkness. 
There is no neutral ground. Some people like to dress that up a little bit more and make things look a little better on the outside, but there's no getting around it. If you are not for him, you are against him. And the Bible says your father is the devil. And he will ultimately destroy you. And that's what he wants to do. And so this boy, as he's caught up in this power that's stronger than him, stronger than the father, he watches his son being thrown in water, coming close to being drowned. He watches his son being thrown in fire. They're open fires during that time, like campfires. That's how they cooked and kept warm. They're and, and so the, the child would just be there and this spirit would grab him and throw him in the fire. We don't know how many times this went on, but it, uh, this father is traumatized. This is, this is something that obviously he's well aware of. He's been a part of. And he's traumatized. And he's telling Jesus about it. But he says this. Notice this. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Notice he says us. Notice a parent sees this as an us problem, not a my kids problem. This is an us. And, and notice the appeal. And this is my third point. Notice the appeal is the appeal to God's mercy. What he's saying is, I don't deserve you to fix anything. You're not obligated to do that. I'm not entitled to to even being here in your presence. But what he does is appeal to something about Jesus that he knows and really is an attribute of God and that is that he is compassionate. God is a compassionate God. What is compassion? The actual word means that he is a God that suffers with us. So like the parent suffers with the child, so Christ suffers through all of us who are under the power of darkness. He suffers with us. He suffers with those that are going through that. And so the Father, He says, if you can have compassion, if, if you can do anything, just have compassion and help us. What He's appealing to is God's mercy. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, Mark 6, 34, Mark 8, 2, and here in our text, those are all places where Jesus said he has compassion. He had compassion on a leper. He had compassion on the people who had, were with him and weren't eating. He has compassion on, on here in our text, but Jesus is a compassionate God. That that means, and, and as, as we pray, here's something that's very important. As we pray that we can appeal and pray to His mercy and compassion. It's His compassion that motivates Him towards us. It's His compassion that doesn't allow Him to stay in heaven and let us sweat it out and fight it out here and not involve Himself at all. His compassion drove him from heaven to earth to rescue us. It's as if his compassion can't sit still and stand by seeing our pain and our suffering. It's his compassion that drives him to us. As we see in Psalm 86, 15, where it says, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and in truth. And so when we pray, 
we can pray and ask God to have compassion and mercy on us. But then he says in verse 23, as the story moves on, Jesus says to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So, to this man, to broader than this man, the disciples, to broader than the disciples, the multitudes, to broader than the multitudes, the scribes, Jesus makes this statement that it really all comes down to faith. It comes down to believing. And that believing is trusting God. And so, what we can do when we read something like that is say, Lord, you say that all things are possible if I believe. So what we can do is think about those things that are heavy on our heart. Think about those things that are important to us. Think about those things that we think about at night that we think about on our bed, that we think about when we wake up. And, and ask yourself, is, is there something in Scripture that would, would tell me it's God's will for this to happen? And if it is, Say, for example, you pray for a loved one or a lost one, like in our text, that's in the grips of Satan. It is his will to save them because it's God's desire that no one would perish, the Bible says. So we say, Lord, like this man, I'm bringing my whoever it is, I'm bringing him to you and I know it's in your will to save this person. And so I'm going to pray and believe that you're going to save this person. And that's what Jesus is saying. So what God is teaching is the lesson of faith. The importance of faith and the power of faith. And remember, this faith now is what we live by. We live by what God says and we put our faith in what he says. We put our faith in who he is and what he's done. And we don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, and that's the things that God says. And we trust and believe that God is working behind the scenes to bring about the things that we're praying for that are in His will. This is an amazing way to live. This is a confident way to live because we're not confident in ourselves, we're confident in God and what He says. So, verse 24, as he tells this to the man, and really I think he's teaching the disciples, he says, Immediately, the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. This is amazing. This is astonishing faith because he recognizes he does believe and that's exemplified by the fact he brought his son to Jesus he kneeled down before Jesus he shouted he wouldn't have done that if he didn't believe Jesus could help him but like this man we often we believe, but there's parts of us where it's hard to believe. So say, for example, an unsaved friend or loved one, family member, whatever it is. We believe God can save them, but there's a part of us that just says, that's just not going to happen. I see what's happening in this person's life. Sin has gripped them so much. It's just not, it's just, I, but this man recognized that he didn't have full faith. He had some, enough, a lot, but there is still a part of him that's like, gosh, I just, 
I can't even imagine something changing. Because what would be necessary for that would be completely supernatural. And what he is saying, like all of us, we're so geared to determine things in our mind by just how things look. And we often get set in that pattern of, of this is just how things are because that's the way they look. And God is saying you have to have faith and recognize those areas where you're not believing and you're being sort of cynical and saying, oh, sure, oh, you're going to save not my kid. You don't know how far he's gone. And, 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 but it's okay to recognize that, but then ask God to help you with that unbelief. Because we can only believe to the extent that God gives us the measure of faith to believe. So what we're asked to do is to believe to the maximum amount of faith that we've been given to believe. Whatever that measure is. And as we have this faith and as we believe and you see this man as he's broken down and he's emotional because he's recognizing that he doesn't fully believe, and he, but he prays, help my unbelief. And as he prays, help my unbelief, we see the power of faith. This is where power, it's like a, a railroad track that power runs on. It runs on the railroad track of faith. And so in verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you. That's it. When, when that word is there, when Jesus says, I command, it's it. Done deal. I command you. Jesus commanded everything we see, the earth to come into existence. When Jesus commands something, it is. And so he says, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. In other words, this is done. This is not a temporary thing where the demon comes out, finds the person unsaved, and then seven more demons come back. He's saying, enough. No more dominion of darkness over this individual. And what Jesus is showing is the power of God. This is the power of God. So when we think about power, there's a lot of ways we can think about it, but ultimate, the ultimate power is the power of darkness and the power of light. And what we're seeing is the power of light is the ultimate supreme power that really has no competition and the power of darkness can't resist or can't fight. And if Jesus commands, it's over. And so the power of God is the ultimate power. So verse 26, then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out. But notice this, the boy became as one dead. This experience took a toll on this boy where he, was, he looked like he was dead. Isn't this a great picture of what happens when God saves us from our sin and from darkness and our, we're dead to those things? We're dead. He, he's dead to darkness and evil. But look in verse 27. Jesus took him by the hand. Great picture of how we're saved. We're dead. Darkness is dispelled. The power of darkness, Jesus conquers. And we're, we're just like dead now. And Jesus picks us up. He lifted him up and he arose. And as we see here, then, this is the power of God. This is what we need. 
This is what's available to us. This is the power over all other powers. This is the power to walk as Jesus called us to walk. But the last thing is, how, how do we do this? How does this work? So this, this is the final explanation. And it's the power then that's given to us. So in verse 28, so after this whole scene is over, when Jesus had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, and they said, why could we not cast it out? Why were we powerless? Why were we unsuccessful? And he said to him, this kind. Why did he say that? Because he's telling his disciples and he's telling us there are different levels of demons that have different levels of power. And he's saying this kind. So the kind with the type of power that this demon had can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. What was happening here? The disciples, because of their missions trip, where they were sent out two by two in Mark chapter 6, and they were given power over unclean spirits, and they were successful. What happened here is now they weren't depending on God anymore. They just thought, well, we can just do this thing. We don't have to look to God. We don't have to depend on Him. Sort of like thinking, well, now we have this power. But the power that we have is simply power that God gives us. And they had become self-reliant, self-dependent. And that's what happens to us oftentimes as Christians. How do we know we've become self-reliant and self-dependent? Well, good way is we're not in our Bibles. We're not praying we're not serving and exercising our spiritual gifts. We're not seeing the need for corporate worship. We stop attending church. Those are all signs that we're saying, I got this. That's what we do. We say, I got this. I had some success in the past, but now I got this. This is what the disciples, and if we have that attitude, we've become spiritually powerless. Because those just those things I described are signs or characteristics that we're depending on ourselves. But if we really understand the spiritual opponent that we're up against, but also that we have power in Christ to easily conquer those powers, then we will be in a continual state of depending on God, of seeking God. And that's what he means when he says this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. He's saying that there's a lack of dependence on God and a lack of understanding the full power of God that he wants to give you. So now you're just kind of doing it yourself. And this is what happens when people fall, when people backslide. They, they start to move away from prayer and and fasting, spiritual disciplines, depending on God. And a way many people do that is we become confident because, you know, we've come, come to church or we go to serve or something and we just kind of got it. And God is saying, you don't got anything. You got nothing. I know it's not proper English, but to get my point, you got nothing. And I remember... As God sort of continued to sort of lead my life as a young Christian to a growing Christian to a serving Christian and then into the ministry, I remember thinking along the way, like, God, you have to make me a different person. I can't be me and do this. I distinctly remember that. Like, okay, I'll move to... Texas to plant a church from California, but you got to make me a different person. Like, I can't be the same guy and do that. Okay, you want me to stand up before people and teach them the Bible, but you got to make me a different person. I can't be me and do that. 
But that's the sort of understanding and attitude that we need to have that there is a tendency for us all to be complacent and we'll be, become complacent, complacent. It's evidenced by our spiritual disciplines and our lack of spiritual disciplines demonstrate that we don't have faith. And that's when we begin to backslide, get complacent, begin to fall. And eventually, unless we repent and turn, we'll fall into sin. A person with faith, they're in the Word constantly. They're with the people of God constantly. They're stirring up their spiritual gift. They are meeting together corporately with the body of Christ. They are constantly talking about the Lord and sharing the Lord and sharing the gospel. And they are completely dependent on Him for everything. And this is a person that's going to be successful in their walks with God. And so, as we finish today, I just have a few verses I want to share with you in regards to the power of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The disciples were told to wait until you get this power. Don't just go out and start doing stuff. Ephesians 3.20 To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, get this, according to the power that works in us. Ephesians 6.10 Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Romans 8.11 The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Amen. Are you kidding me? Amen. How can we walk so weakly when we have the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead in us? In 2 Corinthians 10, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. We must have the power of God actively working in our lives. Amen. Let's pray.